Hello, my name is Stanford Gibson. I am the sediment transport specialist on the RAS team. And this is the second part of a workshop that I taught with Dr. Jay Pack, who is in charge of the sediment transport capabilities in HEC HMS. He talked about how to compute post wildfire debris yield using our hydrology software, HEC HMS. So if you haven't seen that, I have a link below. Go check that out first. And then once you know how much mud and debris your watershed is going to yield in a post wildfire scenario, then you go to go to RAS and do our kind of high concentration non-Newtonian hydraulics, which is what I cover here. I'm going to talk about like the non-Newtonian physics in HEC RAS and then show some applications and then finally I do a demonstration at the end. This workshop was put on by the Corps of Engineers National Flood Risk Management Program and it had you know over a hundred folks from multiple different agencies. These capabilities were developed by the Corps of Engineers R&D Post Wildfire Program and the training was funded by the HHNC SET program. Uh, HMS and now we're going to move downstream and talk about RAS. Uh, my name is Stanford Gibson. I'm the sediment transport specialist on the RAS team. And uh, everything I do today that I'm going to show you today was a, a collaboration with Alex Sanchez. Um, Alex Sanchez wrote a lot of the 2D code that uh, that you're going to see. He wrote a lot of the debris flow library. He was going to be on today, not feeling well, not COVID, um, but not feeling well. And so he's uh, he's not going to be on today, but I just want to acknowledge that uh, this, this is not all my stuff. Also, Ian Floyd, who uh, who Jay mentioned, he's in charge of the whole R&D program in the Corps of Engineers and was involved in like choosing these algorithms and you know funding this work. And um, so the, this work all reflects uh, his uh, his his thought and reflection as well. All right. So, as many of you know, in uh, um, in uh, January uh, 2018, uh, there was an intense rainfall, a particularly intense 15 minutes in the mountains of Stream of Santa Barbara, um, which that watershed also happened to be on fire. So the rainfall put out that fire, um, and this. Had, this event was uh, had 23 fatalities and over $200 million of damage. And uh, it kind of put the, you know, it was on Oprah, right? Like it, it put this process that we're talking about on the map for a lot of people, even though the people on this call know all the stuff that Jay has been talking about is that these events have been on the rise for a while. Um, but this kind of put it on the popular map. And so, um, you know, the, uh, there's, there's, there's an excellent, Excellent follow-up work um, by Keen et al. And I, actually, this is USGS and California Geological Survey. Some of the con contributors or people who know the contributors may be on this uh, on this call. Um, they went out and did some really good work to you know capture the the, the inundation boundary polygons, which are in blue in this plot um, from this event. There were kind of three distinct events, and. Uh, one of the things that people immediately tried to do was to run RAS. And you know, RAS is the most popular water resource software in the world. It's, it is the kind of go-to emergency ma management software um, for developing floodplain boundaries. We have about 100,000 downloads a year in 200 countries. Um, but until recently, we only had Newtonian assumptions. And so uh, the this is what the Montece the, what the San Ysidro event um, looks like if you just run it in Newtonian RAS. It like it badly underpredicts. You know, it's it's scarcely like a it's scarcely like a significant flood event. Um, but it was the the triggering of the hydrophobic soils and the the, the debris that made this catastrophic. And so we need to do something. Um, now, this is this is a post wildfire community, and so most of the folks on this call are interested in the post wildfire impacts. But there is another major application. There's actually several. We'll talk about some of the other ones. People have used the non Newtonian stuff in RAS for um, for lava, for ice flows, for um, you know log jams. Uh, but um, the other major uh, application is mine tailing dams. And so, just like a year later, um, after the uh, the Montecito event um, in January of 2019, we had the Brumahilo dam failure in Minajarice. 
Um, this was a you know a mine tailings dam failure that collapsed. Um, there were 270 deaths, um, and it was just three years after another mine tailing dam failure collapsed in Minas Gerais. You might you, so Minas Gerais is the state of Brazil where this happens, and in Portuguese, Minas Gerais means general mines. You know this is a state in Brazil that has hundreds or thousands of these mine tailing dam failures. This is the second one in a few years, but there have been several, and you know there been a number of these mine tailing dam failures you know, around the world. Um, this released 12 million cubic meters of sediment downstream, and the uh, the damages that have, that have been awarded have reached seven billion dollars. And so, these are some of the most catastrophic events that we deal with in emergency management. And uh, the Newtonian flows in RAS, the the you know the primary go-to tool for emergency management flooding, um, couldn't handle them, and so uh, we turned to that and said, you know, um, let's let's bring non-Newtonian physics into RAS. And so that's what we're going to talk about today: is doing these non-Newtonian mud and debris simulations in RAS. And it's got basically three parts, um, and they're not symmetrical. Uh, but you know, first of all, we're going to talk about um, non-Newtonian physics and the kind of the theory behind the non-Newtonian and debris mud and debris flow hydraulics in RAS. Um, you know. It's actually really easy to add these parameters and run this non-Newtonian. You like once you know how to do it, you can do it in about eight minutes. Um, but I, but you shouldn't, right? You like um, putting buttons and putting numbers in open spaces and pressing compute. Yeah, you know, that's not what models are about. You want to understand what you're doing. So as you change the parameters, you change them in a way that makes sense to you. So we're going to talk about the like theoretical framework and how it works into the equations. And then I'm going to show you some applications. We're going to do some. VNV, which is that's uh, that's model developer speak for validation and verification, just to show you some models that we've done to test the software to see how it's working, both on the on the laboratory and meso scale, and then we'll show you some prototype scale applications. Um, and then finally, I have one of those those lab models. I have I've, we've given it to you in the uh, in the Google Drive. And uh, and we'll I'll just kind of walk you through it. We'll add the non-Newtonian materials and run it. And you can either you can either follow along at home or you can just kind of watch. And uh, and and uh, there it, there's actually a video workshop that walks you through it. Um, that you you could do it later if you wanted. So you know, as we talked about, we were we just did HMS. Um, now we know the sediment load, or at least we know the sediment load plus or minus fifty percent, hopefully, um, and we can compute a concentration. And now we want to put it in RAS and do some hydraulics. Um, and so here's the first question: Which solid interaction processes can significantly affect the physics of a debris flow? You can choose as many of these as you like: A, increased viscosity; B grain collision, C, biological density, D, matrix strength. Uh, this was almost all of them. I, it was cheeky. Uh, I added biological density. I actually made that little, that little thing. Uh, it doesn't really matter how many worms you have in your, um, in your debris flow, but all of these other things matter. And that's part of the problem. Um, is that you know Jay even Jay had his own kind of cheeky definition of what a debris flow is, um, but the truth is is that debris flow is a word with semantic range. I can say debris flow, and of the 136 people who are on this call, there are probably seven to twelve different um, different definitions. Right, large woody debris. That's the first thing that comes to mind when I hear debris flow. But actually, the technical definitions are different, and the reason is is that when we talk about a muddy debris flow we're distinguishing it from a clear water flow and so what that means is that we've gotten enough solids in our flow in our mixture that the solids start to interact with the liquid and each other and so i'm primarily a sediment transport modeler i primarily run sediment transport you know dual phase sediment transport and when you when you model sediment transport the idea is you model the water and then the water can influences the the solids um but the solids don't influence each other and they don't influence the water when you get into mud and debris flow what happens is you have enough solids that the solids are actually influencing the water and influencing each other and the other thing that makes mud and debris flows um you know kind of difficult to define is that the solids can have multiple effects and as the you increase concentration and as you increase the size of the solids the effects 
um, can change so that the nature of the mud and debris flow and even the definition of it changes. And so, you know, the first thing that happens as you increase the concentration is that you change the viscosity of the material. You increase the viscosity of the material by adding, uh, you also increase the volume, um, but we'll get to that. Um, but you increase the viscosity of the material. As you add even more solids, now the flow the flow field actually has to go around and through the solids, and you actually get interparticle turbulence um, is what, what some people call it. But the idea is, is that you get vertical flow gradients that actually end up acting on the 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 solid face. But there's a big threshold when you go, move from like kind of a a water dominated um, matrix uh, a mixture to a mixture that has enough um, sediment density that the particles start to collide significantly. When the particles start to collide significantly, then you actually start to lose energy from the particle versus, on particle collision. Um, and that's when we start to that's when we start to move from where in, in at least one taxonomy, there are a number of taxonomies, but at least one taxonomy or the, the language we're going to use today, um, you start to move from a mud flow to a debris flow. Um, and then finally, you get to a point where you, know, you no longer have primarily water with solids in it, but actually you've got primarily solids with water in it. And at that point, once you, once you have um, like grain to grain friction, well, then you've kind of left the world of hydraulics and you've entered the world of geotech. And so once you're in the world of geotech, well, now um, the main things that are, are driving this are geotechnical strength or matrix strength. And so we can actually use geotechnical equations. There, another thing that complicates this is that, okay, so these processes start to engage and different ones become dominant as you go from lower concentration to higher concentration. But it's not a uniaxial scale because you're more likely to have grain collision at lower concentrations if your particles are larger. And so these, you actually start to move through these different processes as your sediment moves from finer sediment to coarser sediment. And so there are a number of um, kind of quantitative taxonomies of geological flows like this. Um, I think the, the most intuitive is this ternary taxonomy by Phillips and Davies. The ternary is just, a, it's a fancy geology word that means we're going to do it in a triangle. Um, and these are quantita three quantitative scales in a triangle, and you have three independent variables. You have the water percentage, the percentage by volume of coarse particles, and the percentage by volume of fine particles. And so here's what's going on here is that when you're at like 20, 30% water, you're still probably getting non-Newtonian effects. You still can get non-Newtonian effects, but this is all kind of hyper-concentrated flow. Um, and it isn't until you get past that 20, 30% water that you move into what we consider this mud flow, debris flow, clastic flow zone. But what's the main process dis difference? What's the main difference between this, uh, this kind of white zone and this gray zone here? Well, in the white zone, you have enough water, um, you have enough water so that the water velocity is still significantly larger than the sediment velocity. The water is transporting the sediment, right? The, the, the water is dominant. And so, you know, obviously uh, if it's clay, the wash load is about the same velocity, but we're talking about the coarse particles. The coarser particles are still being transported by the water and are being transported more slowly. But when you pass this threshold, now your um, sol the, the solids are a significant enough component of your flow that they're transporting at the same velocity as your water. Your water doesn't have space to move around the particles at a different velocity. And so now it's traveling as a mud or as a debris uh, flow. And now we have to simulate it differently. Another thing that I find really interesting is, so I do a lot of high concentration sediment transport modeling, things like dam removals or reservoir flushes. You know, these are these are very high concentration um, sediment models, and I've done quite a few of those. And one of the interesting things is like dam removals and sediment flushes, those are high concentration alluvial events, but they all fall kind of in this zone right here. None of them even reach what we're talking about as hyper concentrated flow, which that's pretty remarkable. Um, and so we are really talking about kind of massive sediment events.
Okay, so there are a number of these taxonomies, um, and uh, it kind of shows you how complicated the language can get, but the basic idea is that we're going to categorize them based on the concentration of the material and the percentage of um, fines and cohesive material. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Like, how does this actually work its way into the RAS equations? Well, in clear water flow, um, most of the losses, most of the energy losses um, are due to boundary effects. Uh, and that's not entirely true. You know, we have turbulence, we have lateral stuff, but, let, but just for this heuristic, um, you can think of it, if you're doing clear water flow, you're basically going to compute the losses from the water um, ground boundary. And this is where we get like the Manning's end value from, right? It's it, all of the things go into this Manning's end value and we compute the losses at that boundary. That changes once you engage these other processes. Because, because these other processes, now you're going to have energy losses internal to the fluid. You're gonna have internal viscous losses, you're gonna have inter internal losses due to particle collision, and then eventually you could have internal losses due to just geotechnical friction. And so we need to account for those in our hydrodynamic equations. It's no longer enough just to deal with the boundary friction. Okay, so this next slide is scary. I, I know, I know, I, I, it, it's a continuum. There's gonna be some continuum mechanics, but I promise you that these are the only differentials. Um, those of you who have heard me talk before have heard me cite the famous Chester Watson who always says the best way to lose a crowd is to throw up the backward sixes, right? The backward sixes are the gang, side, the gang sign of engineering, but, the, but it's not that hard. Um, I, I promise you, I will walk you through this, um, stay with me. Uh, these are the governing equations, um, what we call the shallow water flow equations. All it is, is the conservation of mass, flow in, has to equal flow out, versus the, you know, minus or plus what's stored, that's all that's going on there, um, and the conservation of momentum. Now, how do we account in clear water flow for this boundary friction in these equations? Well, that goes into the conservation of momentum equation, that shouldn't be a surprise because you're losing momentum, right? And it goes in there, as a friction slope. The friction slope is actually in Manning's equation. So when you put an end value in RAS, we just back, we just back calculate the Manning's equation for the friction slope, we stick it in there, and there it is. Th those are your losses. Now, the thing that's really convenient about you know, defining losses as a friction slope, there's two things that are convenient about that. One is that it's dimensionless. And second is that it's not raised to any power or internal to any differential, which means that if we want to add other losses, we can just do that. We, it's linear. And so we can add loss terms in the form of these dimensionless slopes. And so for example, we have an, and so obviously we mainly do this in two dimensions, but I'm showing you the one dimensional equations because they're kind of, they're less threatening. Um, but, you know, so we, in one dimension, we have this expansion contraction loss. Well, we just compute that as a dimensionless slope and put it in that term additively. So if you want to include internal friction terms or internal loss terms, well, you could imagine that we would just add a, another internal loss friction slope um, that would account for these internal losses. That's pretty easy except where are we gonna get that? Like, how do we turn these complicated processes into a dimensionless slope? That is not entirely intuitive until we introduce the magic of the shear stress equation. The shear stress equation is, shear stress is gamma RS. Um, the, uh, the unit weight of the fluid, uh, the, the hydraulic radius, which we can you know, usually switch out for depth, and the friction slope which means that we can compute the friction slope as the, the ratio of the shear stress divided by things we already know. So now all we have to do is we have to, um, we have to conceptualize these processes as a shear stress, which is more intuitive, but it's not totally intuitive, right? Like what is the internal shear stress? Well, that's where we introduce Rheological models. Rheological models, re rheology is just a fancy word for the science about how materials deform. If you apply a stress to a material, how does it 
how does it smear, right? That's really what we're talking about. How does it deform? How does a material deform under stress? Okay, so before we go into rheological models, let's see what you remember from mechanics of materials. Uh, I actually didn't take, um, I actually didn't, I, my undergrad wasn't in engineering. I didn't get engineering degrees till grad school. So I actually learned this in structural geology. Um, but, uh, these are four rheological models. In fact, these are four rheological models that are available to you in RAS. And all a rheological model is, is a theoretical relationship between stress and strain. And so which of these stress-strain relationships is a Newtonian fluid, like water? Go ahead and, go ahead and put it in the, in the chat. So the, the definition of a, non, of a Newtonian fluid is that there is a linear relationship between stress and strain and there is a zero in intercept. So uh, C and D are out because the relationship is nonlinear and then B is out because there, because there is a what we call a shear strength which will become very important in our conversation. There is a range of, of, uh, of stresses under which you get no strain. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about rheological models. Um, rheological models are, you know, deformation, you know, heuristics. They're, they're, they're approaches to stress versus strain. And so the most basic rheological model is the Newtonian model. Here's the idea. If you apply a stress to water, it is going to deform kind of in proportion to the stress you apply. It's linear. And is there any amount of any like minuscule amount of stress that you can apply to water where it doesn't move? No, no, water moves immediately as soon as it gets touched. The simplest non-Newtonian, so this is what we call the Newtonian um, approach, the, the, the Newtonian model. The simplest non-Newtonian model is still linear, but now we have a, um, we have a non-zero intercept. We call this the Bingham plastic model. The Bingham plastic model um, has this non-linear intercept, this non-zero intercept and a different slope. And so the, in the Bingham plastic model, we have a shear stress that is a function of a yield strength, which is this, this region, this, the, the maximum shear that you can apply to this and still get zero strain. Um, and so you could put this much shear on the fluid and it's not gonna move. And then the slope of this line is just the viscosity of the material. That's an actual physical property. That's a property you can measure, the viscosity. And so the Bingham plastic is kind of the most conceptually clean and kind of the simplest non-Newtonian rheological model. And frankly, it's it's always my starting point because um, I like I have a basic uh, ideology that the more complicated a process is, the more the the simpler the equation it, that I want to use because I want to um, I want to minimize my free parameters. Um, and so we're going to talk a lot about this being a model. Um, but do you see what what's happening here? I've just computed a shear stress. Well, remember what we needed? We needed a shear stress. Once we get a shear stress, then we can get our internal loss slope and plug it into the momentum equation. And so we're going to make an initial assumption ab about what rheological model, uh, what's the rheology of our fluid, and then we're going to parameterize it, and then we can simply use that to compute the, the internal losses of the fluid. Now, not all of these are uh, linear. Um, there are nonlinear uh, uh, stress-strain relationships. And the idea there is that if, if, if a stress-strain relationship is nonlinear, then kind of the more um, shear you apply to it, the easier it is to deform, or the more shear you apply to it, the harder it becomes to deform. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of people have found that the mud and debris flows that we're dealing with are in fact nonlinear. In fact, O'Brien uses a quadratic form, which is available in RAS, where there is like the the it starts with the Bingham. You have this, you know, the, this yield term and this linear term with velocity, viscosity, but then you have this quadratic term as well, making it nonlinear. And that's called shear thickening. As the shear increases, so does the viscosity. Um, shear thinning is the opposite. Um, as the shear increases, the viscosity drops. How does this map onto the different processes? Well, O'Brien was kind of 
it was the one that kind of um, spelled this out. Um, Jim O'Brien, um, in, in his work, said that, you know, you can kind of think of each of these different processes as a cumulative term in the internal shear. And so for hyper concentrated flow or even mud flow, well, for that, we'll just, we can use the big and plastic because you're not getting these complicated grain effects. Um, and so, you know, we just need the yield and the viscosity terms. As you get into these grain flows and mud flows, now, um, now again, I've often just used being in plastic and it's worked very well, but, uh, but the premise of O'Brien's work is that now you have these more complicated forces, you're gonna need nonlinear dynamics. And so you can use, uh, you know, a, a, a more complicated rheological model. And then once we get over into the grain dominated stuff, the, the friction dominated stuff, well then, you know, we're kind of leaving the, the fluid world and we're going to the geotechnical world. And how do geotechs conceptualize stress strain relationships? Well, they do that with Coulomb theory. And so that's what we'll do. We'll just use Coulomb theory from geotech to come up with a nonlinear stress strain relationship. And so the idea is that all, these are all available in RAS and you can go and choose your rheological model and parameterize it and then we will compute a shear. Well, there actually is a step, right? In order, if you parameterize your rheological model, in order to compute a shear, you're gonna need to know the strain. And so what's the strain? Well, here's the simple Bingham model, right? But in all these cases, you need to know the strain in order to um, in order to get a shear out of your rheological model. Well, what is the deformation of water? How does water deform as it flows? Or fluid? How does fluid deform as it flows? Well, the surface tends to travel faster than the the deepest portion, essentially the there's a velocity distribution. The shallower you are, the faster you go. And so if you assume zero velocity at the base and kind of maximum velocity at the surface, well then that's actually a deformation profile. And so um, what O'Brien does is he says, you know, the, the, the strain is going to be, you know, this ratio of the flow to the depth and he uses a ratio of three. And so we followed that. And so now, you know, the, the velocity and depth, those are things that RAS will calculate. RAS will calculate that in the cross section or in the 2D cell. And so now we've got a strain, we've got a rheological model, we can pick off a shear, and then we can compute the internal loss, the internal losses and plug it into the momentum equation. And that is what's called the single phase rheological approach to mud and debris flow. Now, this has limitations and it has detractors. Um, you know, Dr. Richard Iverson is, you know, he is kind of the, he's the mud and debris goat, you know, you know, undisputed every, every you know, he's, he's the, been the expert and he's not a fan. Um, and he has, he has a paper called the debris flow rheology myth and, uh, and you know, it, it's, a, it's important to account for the limitations and the limitations of the single phase approach is that it's a single phase approach. We assume that the material is all like one kind of mixture. And those of you who have kind of seen debris flows in the in the lab or the field know that um, that there are snouting effects. So you know that they, they they form front they form coarse fronts. They form dams that back up the fluids. And so it's not it's not. A, a tidy single phase and models that account for these different phases can outperform single phase models. They're also very complicated. Um, and uh, we're going, you know, for now, um, single phase has actually performed very well in most of the contexts that we applied it. So we'll continue to do so. But it's worth, it's worth noting, particularly in areas where you have these large clasts that can form dams and do form dams, that uh, this is the primary place where single phase approaches break down. Another question, which of these are examples of non-Newtonian materials? You can select as many as you want. Molasses, lava, mud and debris flow, gasoline. Go ahead, give me some letters. All right, I saw a lot of right answers. Um, it is. A, B, and C. Uh, the uh, gasoline actually is, uh, behaves as a Newtonian fluid, even though it's less dense. Um, so in interestingly, this picture, um, this molasses picture, this was an actual event. Um, this, it, you can, don't do it now. After work, you can go to YouTube and type in 1919 molasses disaster. Don't do it now. 
Um, but uh, the uh, in in 1919, right after World War One, there was this giant vat of molasses um, in Boston. Um, it was it was part of a mil it was part of post military um, industry, and the the vat um, exploded or it, it buckled. It wasn't strong enough to hold the molasses, and they, there was this giant molasses flood in downtown um, Boston. And if you apply you can't apply Newtonian physics to reproduce it. You have to use non-Newtonian equations. This lava um, picture is from, I don't know, if the, I don't know those, of you, I'm tied into all the eruption channels. I'm very interested in when this happens. This is the Galapagos. Um, the Galapagos just, just erupted uh, last week. I told my wife that she's like, I didn't know that that happened. Uh, the, the Galapagos actively erupted, neither did I, but uh, apparently it does. So uh, anyway, the uh, molasses, lava, mud under reflow, um, ketchup is another one. Um, some bodily fluids. The, there, there are. There's a number of medical folks that use non-Newtonian um, dynamics for um, internal uh, circulation. Okay, so let's transition to. Well, how do you put this in RAS? All right, kind of. I told you what we do, right? Now. You, now we're going to talk about what you do. And, and for those of you who are kind of new to RAS or, um, you know, I I think I'm one of the only members of the RAS team that was a RAS user before I was a developer. Um, and so I remember what it was like to be new to RAS. I, I think I'm the only one on the RAS team that actually had that experience. Um, and I think that mainly I loved it. Mainly I thought it was a great program. But for the first month, the thing I thought was most confusing was the file management strategy. Um, this whole idea of a plan and a, a geometry file and a flow file, I was like, why did they organize it this way? This is so confusing. And after a month, I realized it was like the only way to do it, and it was really powerful. But for that first month, it was pretty confusing. And so the idea is that you have a project file um, that ha that's the big umbrella for everything you're going to do in RAS. And then you have these component files. You have geometry files where you have your terrain or cross sections. You have flow files where you input your, your boundary conditions. And then you could have sediment or water quality files, which you might think you need for a debris flow because it's so sediment rated. But actually, how we have um, debris flow in RAS right now is that it's fixed bed. We don't actually deposit or erode, at least not in 6.1. We have added that and we are testing it. But in 6.1, um, it's not available. And so, um, you're actually not going to need a sediment file. You just need a geometry file, a flow file, and a plan file to tie them together. And where is the non-Newtonian stuff? Well, it's in the flow file because it affects the nature of the fluid. And so, um, you know, the people on this call are very interested in um, non-Newtonian mechanics, but most of the world isn't. I have lots of users in, I mean, my, my biggest sediment power user is in Kansas City, and he's just not interested in non-Newtonian mechanics. Um, but the, uh, but, so we kind of hide it. You have to know where it is. So if you go to options, non-Newtonian parameters, you will see that there's a special uh, surprise under that as well, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and this is the non-Newtonian um, editor. It's not that complicated. Um, there, there really isn't that. There really aren't that many data to put in it. Putting the data in is not the hard part. Coming up with the parameters is the hard part. And so, the first thing you do is you choose a non-Newtonian method. Um, and uh, you know, by default, it'll just say Newtonian, and all of this will be grayed out. Um, and so that so you have a drop down that gives you the different options. Um, you can choose the Bingham method. Um, you can choose the O'Brien method. We have a clastic flow method and um, the generalized Herschel Bulkley. We'll get to each of those. Um, the Bingham method I've already, I've already talked about. Um, you know, that is just these first two terms, just the yield and the viscous shear, and so. Let's talk a little bit about those in, in a little more detail. You know, the uh, you're going to have to choose a what we call a sediment laden viscosity, um, which is going to be higher than the dynamic viscosity of the water itself, um, and uh, and that's going to be the slope of this curve. I didn't draw this very well because these have the same slope. Um, the Bingham plastic will actually have a higher slope than your non-Newtonian than your Newtonian fluid, your water. But the other piece is this intercept. Now, this intercept ends up being very important because the, one of the big differences in a mud and debris flow is that it can withstand a certain amount of stress without moving. Now, usually that doesn't matter because mud and debris flows, they start in the mountains. They move immediately. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because unlike water, mud and debris flows can stop. 
And that is the big difference is that if you send water through a neighborhood, it's going to run down every street. But if you send debris through a neighborhood, it could stop halfway down a street um, you, with, with nothing other than its internal friction to slow it down. And so basically this, this internal yield is important because when the internal strength, stress drops below this internal strength, your debris flow will stop and RAS will stop it. Um, and so we call that run out. Uh, a lot of people want to do run out analysis. They want to know how far will the debris flow reach and who's actually in danger. Okay, so that's the Bingham. The next um, equation is the O'Brien equation. O'Brien, when O'Brien did his work, um, he basically said, okay, th this is fine, but we need we need some nonlinear dynamics. Um, we need to, there are other processes that we need to quantify. And instead of quantifying them kind of just empirically like Herschel Bulkley does, what O'Brien tried to do, which I think is quite clever, is he actually tried to develop the physics of these processes, of the turbulent processes. He has the Prandtl mixing length in there. And then um, this is, this is a, a Bagnold term. Um, he uses Bagnold theory to look at what is the likelihood that particles will collide with each other. And it this is the only place where the grain size actually fits in. And you'll notice that both of these terms are squared. And so it's a quadratic approach. And so what does that look like? Well, you have a quadratic, we call this turbulent, the O'Brien turbulent dispersive model. Um, you're going to get more losses um, because you're accounting for more processes. And so you can put in the same Bingham parameters, um, but now you're also going to get these nonlinear terms, which can be large. Um, and so, uh, so that a lot of people want to use the O'Brien equation for um, large particle debris flows. I tend to stick to Bingham if I can, because I know what's going on. I control the viscosity, I control the yield. Those are terms that make sense to me. Um, these terms are very clever, they're, they, but they're, the, 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 the power is a little arbitrary, I think, and uh, there, there are some issues. Um, so uh, this will give you more losses, but a lot of times I would, pre I would prefer, if, if you don't need strongly nonlinear dynamics, I just increase my viscosity to account for it. That's a preference. <clears throat> um, all right, and so you, you can kind of think of it as you kind of want to walk through these different methods for uh, different processes. Um, if you're hyperconcentrated or mud flow, you got Bingham. O'Brien's equation is for when you transition into like mud flow, grain flow, debris flow. And then the clastic methods, the clastic methods, clastic just means there's a lot of like big stuff in it. And that's where you start moving into the geotechnical method, methods where you get have a lot of friction. Um, and so uh, how do those classic methods work? Well, the idea is we're gonna use the same rheological approach, um, but what, what, is, what do the geotechnical um, components really do? Well, you know, geotech, geotech analyses is really interested of not in how far things move, but when do things start or stop moving? Because geotechs, when something start in general, geotechs build something that they don't want to move. So when something starts moving, it's bad. So all of their analysis tends to revolve around, like, is this thing going to move? And so the geotech um, component is just built into the yield strength. Basically, if you use the clastic methods, you don't you don't define the yield. You let the geotech equation determine the yield strength, which determines when is the material going to start or stop moving. And in that case, you know we have two methods. We we have a kind of the basic Coulomb equation, which you may not remember, but will look vaguely familiar if you took a geotech class. And then we have what's called the Volumy equation, which is a modified um, geotechnical equation, but is a kind of intended for um, this kind of work. And so the idea is, is that eventually, this is, these images are from one of Iverson's papers, um, eventually you, you move from this like flow dominated grain collision mode to this friction dominated mode and that's when things will come to rest. Okay, uh, another question. Which will be faster? If you consider two flows of equal volume, which is important, they're of equal volume, which will be faster, a clear water flow or a debris flow? A, 
the clear water will be faster. B, the debris will be faster. C, this is a silly question. They will be the same. They're both fluids. Okay. The answer is A. And I have to tell you that I would have gotten that wrong. Um, I because I thought the answer was B. I think, oh, debris debris is heavier. And so it's going to move things faster. Um, but if you remember Galileo's experiment, like um the acceleration, yeah, there you go, Gal. Um, like the the mass is mass is not actually part of that term. And so what what yeah, that's right, Brian. What what's the difference? The difference is internal friction. And so internal friction does what to the velocity? It slows it down. Um, and uh, and so in not in general, in every in almost every case, um, for materials of equal volume, the debris flow is going to have more losses. It's going to be fat. It's going to be slower. Now we don't think of this because when debris flows happen. It's usually in these very steep, slow, catastrophic situations. So they're like super fast. They're, they're catastrophic. They happen without warning. Um, it's devastating. But if it was the same volume of water, it would have happened faster. Okay. This question is cheeky. I can tell you that you could defend, you could credibly defend either answer. So I would, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, if you choose an answer, feel free to tell me why, or just choose an answer, and you'll all be right. Um, a debris flow will have a bigger or smaller floodplain area than a water flow of the same peak volume. Okay, so answer A, um, a water flood, a clear water flood with the same peak volume will have a bigger floodplain than a mud and debris flow of the same volume. Or answer B, a debris flow will have a bigger floodplain than a you know, similar a vent um, of water. Okay, so like I said, this is an AYSO question. Everyone wins um, because you can justify both. Um, in general, it's going to be B. In general, the floodplain, which I I don't know, I just like to call I like to call it the mud plane um, of the uh, of the of the debris flow will be larger than its clear water equivalent. Why? Well. The basic continuity equation, right? We already established that because of internal loss friction, um, the uh, the the debris flow will be slower than the uh, than the clear water flow. But you know, where's that going? Where's that material going to go? It's not going to Narnia, right? Like it, we have to account for it in continuity. And so, if velocity decreases, what's going to increase? To compensate the area, which means the depths associated with brief flows are significantly higher, um, which again is why this, these are more damaging. These are more damaging because obviously you've got giant rocks crushing things and more momentum hitting structures. Again, that Keen paper that I cited, um, they actually looked at the uh, the damage pro portfolios of these of these events, um, and. Uh, it was really helpful. We've we've been thinking about that and how to work that into our economic software. Um, but you you're gonna get but you're it's they're also more, more damaging because for the same flow, you know, higher internal losses decrease velocity, but they increase stage. And if you increase stage, you're going to have a wider floodplain. But Kevin Kevin um, argued the opposite point well as well. Okay, yes, in general, in general, your floodplain your mudplain is going to be bigger than your floodplain. But debris flows can stop, and clear water flows can't. And so there are there will be some areas where you know the clear water flow would have kept going and, and you know flooded a whole neighborhood where the debris flow came to rest and stopped. And so the you know the the, the neighborhood downstream of that was spared or just had kind of mi minor water damage. And so you could argue both, um, but in general, your debris flow, it, it just in RAS, when you press compute, um, if you do an area analysis, in most cases, it's gonna be B, your debris, your inundation boundary for your debris flow, even of the same volume, um, generally you're gonna have to increase the volume, but uh, even of the same volume will be larger than your clear water um, floodplain. Okay, uh, that's great interaction, great engagement. Um, also helps me know that uh, people are still out there. Okay, so you might be thinking, 
why do I have to choose? Um, shouldn't, uh, that's right. Oh, this is so good, Mark. So good. Uh, I have to go back to this. Uh, so, um, Mark says the area equals the width times the depth. The mud flow might be deeper, but not necessarily wider. What is that possible? Uh, if you just think of a cross section, depth always translates into width, doesn't it? No, because if you go into your two D now in in one D Raz, it's gonna it's gonna just go like that. But if you go into two D Raz and you draw a cross section and you look at your the lateral profile of your um the lateral profile of your uh, of your debris flow, it's often mounded. It's deeper in the center than it is uh, than it is externally. Why? Because of internal friction, it can hold those slopes, and so that's actually one hundred percent true. Um, yes, mud can mound there, there Brian. Um, so that is why this is actually a cheeky question. That um, it's one of those. Uh, the answer could be either under um, different um, situations. Um, you might be asking, well, why should I make? Why do? Why does Raz make you choose an equation? Um, couldn't we just choose the appropriate equation? I mean, um, given the situation, and uh, we are working on this. We have this is not available in six point one. It won't be available in six point two. Um, this is uh, Ian Floyd has done a lot of work on this, but it, it, this is developmental science. Um, the idea, the idea of a model that will switch. That will choose a rheological model for you, or even more, will switch between rheological models um, based on you know which uh, based on um, during the course of a of a simulation based on the velocity and the and the concentration. Um, that's down the road, but we are working on it. Um, and uh, Dr. Iverson has. A number of uh, dimensionless numbers um, that can be potential thresholds to choose these. These dimensionless numbers could be used um, to help you choose an equation. Um, but uh, this is kind of the this is the the this is R and D stuff that we're working on. Okay, so so far we've talked about the Bingham method, the O'Brien method, and the Clastic flow method. Yeah, the basic idea is Bingham is for hyperconcentrated and mud flow, although I often use it for debris flow. The O'Brien method is when you kind of get into these grain and debris flows. And the classic method, you know, augments either of those because it just defines the yield term um, if you uh, are considering like strong geotechnical effects. Um, the Herschel Bulkley equation uh, doesn't do any of that because it is a kind of theoretical empirical equation. Basically, it says, hey, we believe that there's nonlinear dynamics. We just aren't going to try to um, build those around physics. You're going to do that empirically. And so the herschel bulkley equation looks a lot like the Bingham equation, except there's a K here instead of a mu, and there's a power. And the reason for that is that um, if you raise the strain to a power that's not one, then this is no longer just the viscosity. Um, and so it becomes a linear coefficient that isn't viscosity. And so if n equals one, well then the uh, herschel bulkley equation just collapses to the Bingham equation. Um, but if, uh, if, but n can be, the power can be greater than one or less than one for shear thinning or shear thickening. If the power if the power is greater than one, you're going to have this kind of positive nonlinearity. Um, you could make this power two and like approximate something close to Brian equation. But a lot of the data that I've seen on these materials, if the power is greater than one, it's not 1.5. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why that the quadratic equation often seems a little aggressive. Um, and that's a dilate inner shear thickening material, or you could have a power less than one, which I've also seen data on. Um, and in that case, you have this kind of pseudoplastic or shear thinning. So this is a very flexible model. Um, you can do kind of anything you want. Um, the, the main reason I don't use it is I don't I have any intuitive sense for what these are. Um, I think that as we do more of this work and we get more data sets and we start to kind of build um, databases, um, maybe we'll start to use this more. Um, I've used it in laboratory settings where these have actually been measured. 
Um, but uh, it's hard to measure these in the field. And so I don't see this used a lot in the kind of production work that the people on this call like me would do. Um, I do see more of this um, in academic settings. If you choose Herschel Buckley, well, you're just going to Herschel Buckley still has a yield strength. And so, you know, it's it, the yield strength is you know, the same. And so you're just going to use that. You have the same yield strength options. You can define a yield strength. You can use a power equation, which we'll talk about. Or you can use the classic equations. Um, but then we have these Herschel Bulkley parameters down here. <clears throat> you get the uh, the K, which goes here, and the power, which goes here. You'll also need a volumetric concentration. One of the things that uh, one of the options you're going to have is, do you want to bulk the fluid or not? Um, the idea is that if you have a bunch of sediment in your fluid, <clears throat> if you're if you have sediment kind of to on the order of 30, 40, 50%, um, your mixture is going to be, have much more volume and much more ability to flood than your, than like the clear water flow. You have to account for that volume or you're gonna vastly under predict the impact. And so the question is the, the boundary hydrograph that you put in RAS, does that already have the solid volume in it or not? And so we give you this option. Um, if you're just putting a clear water hydrograph in, like say from you, you run HMS, you get an HMS clear water hydrograph and a concentration. Well, then you put the clear water hydrograph in RAS, you put the concentration in here, and you ask us to bulk, and we will increase the volume that we bring in the model. But if you say you use a um, mine tailing dam failure model to compute the sediment laden hydrograph from that model, well, then you don't, you still need the concentration for some of these other equations, but you don't actually want to bulk your materials. So then you can go in here and say, do not bulk. Okay. A couple more questions. What is this concentration anyways? Turns out there are like five different ways to define concentration. What are we talking about? And so, if one liter, if a one liter mixture includes half a liter of solids and half a liter of liquids, which concentration is larger? A, the concentration by volume. B, the concentration by weight. C, that is a silly question. They are the same. Yeah, uh, oh, what's generally larger? A, B, volume, or weight? Yeah, most of you are getting it. The concentration by weight is larger. Why? Because sediment is heavier than water, right? And so how does that work out? Well, the mass concentration is the mass of the solid over the total mass, which is, you know, the, the mass of the solid accounts for more of the mass of the mixture than the liquid. Whereas the volumetric concentration, this can be 50, right? Because um, half of the, the volume of the solid is half. You know, this table comes from uh, Julian's book. If you don't have Julian's book um, and you do this kind of work, I really recommend it. Um, it's uh, it's very clear and has lots of useful stuff in it. Um, and so uh, he has this table of uh, volumetric concentration versus concentration by weight. And so here's the C a CV of 0 0.5. Um, and the concentration by weight is significantly larger. Why is that? Well, uh, we have these conversion equations um, where you can go back and forth. Um, you could derive these um, or you could use them. Uh, but the idea is you have the specific gravity of the material um, uh, over the one plus the, this, uh, this ratio, and it comes out to 73% um, of the material. Okay, what do we use in RAS? We use the concentration by volume. So if you have the concentration by weight, you have to convert it to the concentration by volume. And the concentration and a good like self check is what's larger. The concentration by weight should be larger. Okay, another question. If a one liter mixture includes half a liter of solids and half a liter of liquids, which concentration is larger? Concentration in parts per million, concentration in milligrams per liter, or they are the same, or it depends on the temperature. All right, everyone seems to be circling B and C. Um, and there's a reason for that, because in sediment transport work, generally, if someone gives me concentration in parts per million, um, I just convert that to 
I just assume it's the same in milligrams per liter. But in um, in hyperconcentrated flows, they tend to diverge. So, like in low concentration situations, the parts per million and the milligram and milligrams per liter are comparable. Um, because because you know it's a it's a low percentage of the material, but as you get into the larger concentrations, uh, milligrams per liter ends up being a mass a, a surrogate for mass, where um, parts per million is a surrogate for volume, and so your milligrams per liter tend to be larger. <clears throat> okay, that's all very confusing. There are a lot of concentrations you could have, and what we need is a fraction. Um, and incidentally, um, we need a percentage uh, in RAS. This is a percentage. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that lots of people make, including me, I've made this mistake at least three times in my own interface is instead of putting 60% there, you put in 0.6 and then you realize you feel that you're like RAS is broken. There are no non Newtonian effects. Uh, don't do that or at least realize when you do it. Um, you need a volumetric concentration in percent. Um, and so what if you get lots of other concentrations? Um, well, I found this confusing enough, and I've kind of had to derive this enough times that I put a calculator in RAS. And so we have a concentration conversion calculator. Um, it's right next, it's a button right next to the field, and uh, it launches this thing, and you go and you get to choose how, how you, the concentration that you have, you click on it, and then you put in your concentration, your specific gravity, and all of and it gives you all the other concentrations. Um, and so, you know, in this case, we're going from volumetric concentration to everything else, but you could put in milligrams per liter to compute your volumetric concentration. Um, and so that's gonna be, that'll be helpful to you to kind of sort through these different, uh, these different types of concentration. Now you'll notice that we only have one concentration in here. Um, that is one of the biggest limitations of the current version of RAS. Um, it's going to be a similar limitation in 6.2. In 6.3, um, we're going to provide the option, hopefully, to have a time series of concentrations. Um, and so you can put in a time series of concentrations. Your concentration can rise and fall, but that's still going to be domain wide. Um, it's not until we actually do tr internal transport um, where the concentrations can vary from upstream to downstream. Um, for now, because it's a fixed bed simulation, you only get one concentration and that is a limitation and, and we'll kind of show you how that works out um, in some of the results. Okay, so the most important thing that you have to do then is you have to um, you have to estimate these parameters. And so you, you're going to have to estimate a, uh, a shear strength and um, a viscosity. Now, there are experimental apparatus to do that. Um, in the lab, it's easier. Um, in the field, it's hard. And during an event, it's impossible, right? And so uh, it, you know, these events, uh, it's just too dangerous to go out and uh, and measure these events. Um, you can make cal that calculate them calibration again. As we do more of this work, I'd like to see more databases developed on these. Uh, you know the parameters that um, that are used to calibrate some of these events, so we can get a better sense of the range. Um, right now, some of the kind of best available um, information is you know, the. Uh, O'Brien has these equations where he computes, um, and he, he, the, these are not original with O'Brien. Um, he he the, there's a there's a literature string in our in our documentation, um, but the uh, the idea is is that um, if you can't pull a, a shield strength or a viscosity out of the air, um, well then there there are these power equations where uh, we have shear strength is some. A uh, some coefficient times 10 times a power times the volumetric concentration. Um, and uh, the viscosity is similar. Uh, it's some small coefficient times um, a power times the volumetric concentration. And the idea there is that uh, we eventually will want these to rise and fall as concentration increases and decreases. So it can be dynamic in that way. Um, but uh, they also provide, in, in Julian's book, Julian also provides, you know, a range of values. And uh, so what we've done in the past sometimes is we've used these equations with um, O'Brien's 
O'Brien with Julian's coefficients for um, what he calls typical soils, um, and they perform pretty well. And so uh, that's not a bad starting point um, to to try to parameterize these equations. But then you know seeing what other people have done in your area, um, applying them to known conditions, um, you'll start to develop an intuitive sense of what the possible range is. RAS 6.2 will be the first time that you will not get a, uh, a PDF um, user's manual. We, uh, you know, software doesn't provide user's manuals anymore. Uh, Word doesn't Word doesn't send you a PDF user's manual, neither does Excel, neither does ArcGIS. Uh, all software is going to like interactive online help, and so are we. And so all of our um, users' documentation is online. Uh, it's here if you want to bookmark it, I have. Um, and one of the cool things about this is uh, we've been developing a lot of like user help videos. We are embedding them right in the uh, right in the user's manual. There's a there's a mud and debris. There's a special mud and debris flow um, manual, so you can go into mud and debris flow, and uh, you know we've got a a user's manual and a technical reference manual. And if you were to if you go into the user's manual in the introduction, um, all of this it, it's all laid out. Um, and in some cases, we have embedded videos right in there um, that will help you walk through these. And so a lot of the stuff that I just talked about, um, it's already in a video uh, in the technical reference manual if you need to review it, plus this video will be available. In 6.2, if you're anywhere in RAS, um, in any field, if you press F1, it'll automatically take you to the page that we think is most useful to you in the user's help. If you open the non-Newtonian uh, editor in 6.2 and you are like, where do I even start? Press F1 and we will take you, it, it, it's like, I don't remember that, 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 you know, Stanford told me to bookmark it, but I didn't. Um, if you press F1, we'll take you there. Uh, let me just show you how this works. Um, uh, these are some applications we've done. Um, I'm going to start by showing you some laboratory and mesoscale validation and verification, and then some field applications. And so this is actually the data set that I've given you. Um, this is the Parsons data set, uh, Parsons and Whipple and, and Simone. Um, they did these really cool um, experiments in 2000 um, where they essentially used a half pipe and sent um, very high concentration material through it and collected some really interesting data. And the thing I really liked about their experiments is that they used materials of very different kinds. They used like very low clastic materials, like very cohesive and high clastic materials and all at very high concentration. And so we simulated a bunch of these. Um, and uh, you know, here's the ternary diagram from Phillips and Davies. And um, here is where their data plot on this ternary diagram. And you can see that the, you know, they are squarely in the debris flow, um, even getting to the classic side, and um, they documented which ones had snouting effects and which ones didn't. So we could kind of see how does single phase um, behave when there are snouting effects. Um, so we uh, we simulated a bunch of these. Um, what I did is I, you know, I just made a one-dimensional half pipe, um, and then I converted it into a two-dimensional terrain with one meter, one meter, one millimeter resolution. I like to believe that I now hold the record for the finest resolution of any RAS terrain anywhere, but uh, it's in your possession now. You can play around with it. Um, and uh, then I just, you know, I modeled these as clear water flows. And so here is um, 10 seconds into a just a clear water flow. This is the velocity result, and you know it's cooking. It's moving really fast. This is high. This is high slope, and clear water just it really moves. And here is the result: 10 seconds into a debris flow. And I'm going to just zoom in on that. And this is an image of the same experiment 10 seconds into the debris flow. And you can see that, you know, we're not only, you know, first of all, the debris flow is slower, like it's supposed to be. Um, it's deeper in response to that, but it also has approximately the same shape um, as, the, uh, as, as the observed debris flow. Um, and so what we've done here is, uh, you know, here they measured the observed plug velocity. Um, and so we modeled these in RAS and we, um, are just plotting the observed um, plug velocity against the 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 computed plug velocity just with Bingham. Um, we just use Bingham. Um, they measured the parameters, and so we used their measured parameters. We didn't um, we didn't uh, 
uh, calibrate that, um, and then compare that to the Newtonian result. Um, the Newtonian result is obviously much, much higher. Um, some of these do have snout effects, and so the outliers tend to have snout effects, and so the single phase model is not doing great, but certainly doing better than um, the Newtonian, um, and we are, we're just following along the line a lot better. Um, the other thing they did is they measured a lateral velocity distribution, and so, so did we. We went in and we measured a lateral velocity distribution, and uh, so the, RAS doesn't output this um, by default. Uh, one of the th interesting things about RAS right now is that uh, we write all of our results to an HDF5 file, and so if there are results that you want in RAS, Python, R, and MATLAB all have libraries to interact with HDF5. Um, I have put some sample R code up for interacting, and basically the code I use to do this, um, to ge to generate a cross section from RAS. Now, of course, uh, you shouldn't have to do that. We should provide you these results, but you know, Mapper is coming along, and uh, we have a long list of things to do. Uh, but what you can see here is, you know, laterally across the flume, they have these observed velocities, which are the open circles, and then RAS has the computed velocities. Now, incidentally, this only works if you use the shallow water flow equations, not the diffusion wave equations, and turn on turbulence, because it's the turbulence model that ca that, um, that causes this, uh, this, this mounding um, and, and the, uh, the transfer of losses between cells. Um, we also did this with all, all of the, the rheological models, and we have a paper on this um, if, uh, if you're interested in looking into it further. The other thing we did is uh, we published this with a multimedia methods and materials. Um, so you can actually go and uh, and reproduce this model from scratch um, just by following three videos. Um, and uh, you know, I gave you the model obviously, so you can just play around with it. But um, it, it's also there. Okay, another model that we worked on and that was this is an analytical solution by from hunger at 1995 and basically the idea here is they said, okay, let's assume a 30.5 meter dam breach um, and uh, with certain with certain Bingham parameters, what is the analytical expectation um, of the runout? Where's it going to stop? Where is it going to where is the shear strength going to ex exceed the shear stress and it's going to come to rest and they computed that analytical distribution um, and so we applied our model to uh, to try to um, replicate that and so this is this is one of those fun plots where you can't necessarily tell the difference uh, until you look at the the uh, result because you know it's an analytical model and so if our if our structure is sound, we should reproduce it, and we do. And then this is kind of the it, this is kind of the gold standard of um, debris flow VNV. This is from uh, the uh, the the volcanic laboratory um, up in Vancouver, um, and they've just run these like really incredible meso scale kind of lahars, uh, you know, high high coarse material, um, high gradient uh, experiments, and they they instrumented this um, so they actually look at the stage distribution, the, the stage hydrograph as these events go through. They looked at different um, water contents and different, uh, different uh, you know, a lot of different parameters. They've done a number of these over the years. I, I, these are not easy experiments to do, and uh, they've just learned a lot from them. And so, uh, we uh, we applied our, the model to this, um, and so the same way I kind of built, I just built it in 1D first, um, and uh, then I converted it to a 2D terrain, um, and here's the result. And so the uh, you can see that the measured is the blue. This is the, the stage hydrographs that they're measuring with their cameras, and the uh, the computed is the black. And uh, this is uh, we're we're getting the timing right and in a lot of cases are very close on the stage um and uh our final lobe actually um is uh is comparable to the uh the run out as well now in a lot of cases these experiments um they they ended up uh going to the side there were snouting effects that caused um things that would make you know a single phase model not perform well we chose one we chose the one that one of the ones that where it was uh you know unidirectional um but it, you know for that it, it performed pretty well now one of the cool things about how we've done this um was 
that all of the things I've talked to you about so far, um, none of I, you know, I've been I've been using the phrase well in RAS, but that's actually not true. None of this is in RAS. Ian Floyd um, and his team down at Erdic and AGC um, Alex Sanchez uh, um, coded all of this in a joint library called Debris Lib. This is a software library that is avail just kind of available for multiple pieces of software to, to call. And so the the core actually has multiple hydraulic software. Uh, you know, we have RAS, which is a HC, which is a 1D finite difference, 2D finite volume, subgrid bathymetry, Fortran code. We also have an excellent 2D model called adaptive hydraulics or ADH, which is a 2D finite area adaptive mesh C++ code. And we wrote debris lives so that both of these models can just call it. Um, and that way, you know, we worked on the equations together, we vetted them together, we V and V'd them in separate models, and now we've attached it to our hydrology models as well, like Geisha and HMS. And one of the things, one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about this in this um, in this setting is there's no reason that we couldn't expand this to other models. Um, and it would be it would be really helpful if other agencies who have models want to make additions to Debris Lab or want to use Debris Lab, we could connect this to other agency other agency models and just have more collaborators on this. Um, we have a paper that's in review um, on that. All right, and then field applications. Okay, back to Santa Barbara. Um, so you remember Santa Barbara, we were not doing very well. Um, and so what we did is we, we remodeled this um, once this was one of the first things we did after we put mud and debris flow in it was still beta when we did it um, but we just you know we we just used the bingham approach with the default julian values um, now when the la when we handed it to the la district they actually took took it and you know did a little bit more fine calibrations but the result that i want to show you is just the bingham model with the default julian parameters for typical soil and there's the result, and you're, it's just it's just doing a lot better. Um, and uh, you know, we we did it for all the watersheds. We did it for uh, Romero and uh, and um, Montecito. But one of the things that you'll see is that we tend to overpredict inundation downstream, and we tend to underpredict deposition upstream. Why is that? We only use one concentration, right? But is the concentration the same all the way through? No, the concentration is higher of stream and then you get settling or you know, vice versa you could get erosion but in this case the erosion mostly happens by the time you get to the boundary of the model and then you get settling and so the concentration is too low for the upstream and too high downstream and so that that's just one of the limitations of this model um is uh it, it's going to perform it's not going to perform as well in these large domains we're working on um a uh, kind of a dynamic routing solution that will deposit as you move downstream um to keep things simple and of course we've got a mobile bed model um that we'll talk about in a minute but uh but but for for a single phase model um the improvement over the improvement was dramatic Okay, we've also applied this to the Brumahilo dam failure. Um, this this dam failure is actually remarkable. They had a camera on it, so you can actually you actually you know, see what happened. Um, and uh, you know this this failed over the course of you know, nine seconds or something like that. And uh, this is downstream. There's a video online where they interview this guy. He got away. Um, but uh, you can see this is not this is a fluid, but it's not water, right? Um, and so uh, you're going to need non-Newtonian parameters to simulate this. And so um, what we so we have this uh, the inundation boundary map, and um, we also have arrival times at three locations, um, and. So you can see this is this is one of our earlier simulations. Um, you know we're 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 approximating the inundation boundary, but what's kind of more remarkable is these uh, these temporal locations. Uh, we are within um, within zero seconds at the first location, within five seconds of the second location, and within two minutes of the third, which is you know less than two percent error. Um, and uh, in the our Brazilian colleague Leon, uh, Leonardo Mosa, who did the original modeling, he said that he used RAS um, with just clear water flow, and it was like it was sloshing over the mountain, right? It just it, it wasn't uh, it, it wasn't giving the result it should have. Okay, um, 
I realize this is post wildfire. I'm not general non Newtonian, but this is too cool not to uh, talk about. Um, we also uh, have been doing lava flow. And so, um, uh, Horn um, Hafstrand Dutter um, in, uh, in Iceland um, got tasked with using RAS to do emergency management for the lava flow that was there. Um, and so what she did is she used the non-Newtonian parameters in RAS. She modeled part, she, she increased the viscosity and the yield of the lava and then modeled it and then let, and then stopped it to let it cool, burned that into the terrain and then modeled again on top of it. And so she reached out to us and showed us what she did and we thought it was cool. And then she's like, is there any way this can be dynamic? And so we have added a a simplified um a simplified lava cooling model in RAS. Um, we actually have a call next week with the GS lab in Anchorage um, and Hannah up there, who the, the folks who actually do this in the GS, and we're kind of we're we're vetting this with them. Um, but the idea is that this is not it's not a full blown lava dynamics model, but it does change the viscosity of the fluid based on a temperature loss algorithm, and so it's kind of it's a simplified first cut that actually does did pretty well um, when we compared it to the uh, the result in Iceland. All right, and then finally, um, everything I've shown you so far is fixed bed, um, but we obviously have a mobile bed sediment transport model in RAS, and uh, there's no reason that we can't connect those, right? Um, basically, what's going to happen is that the non-Newtonian dynamics will change the shear stress um, that is experienced on the bed, um, and then the the any erosion that happens will then um, augment the concentration of the fluid, and so you'll have those two feedbacks. And so this is a Alex Sanchez did this. This is a model of um, of a flume. Basically, it's a dam breach um, and a high concentration mobile bed. Um, and uh, we we've used the the Rickman bed load equation. Does a sediment particle of the same size fall faster in clear water or in high concentration flow? A, it falls faster in clear water. B, it falls faster in a high concentration mixture. C, they're the same. D, it depends on bed roughness. Yeah, um, one of the things that we found, um, it was Nick Ortman did this calculation in at the LA district, is that um, in clear water flow during the Santa Barbara, you know, at, in a in a clear water flow in the Santa Barbara event, like the uh, basically wash load through the debris basin is it's like very fine sand. Anything coarser than very fine sand will deposit. But during the uh, during the debris flow, um, fine gravel is wash load because of hindered settling. The settling velocity is 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 so low. The, the settling velocity um, drops so much that it, that it stays in suspension because of those vertical turbulent, um, you know, intergrain uh, vertical gradients. And so we have several hindered velocity um, equations in, in RAS mobile bed that you can use for um, debris flow. Again, th none of this, none of this is in 6.1. Uh, we'll, it may be kind of secretly in 6.2, but we probably won't release it till 6.3. But just so you know, it's coming. And uh, you know, and any of you who are federal or state partners, if you ever want developmental software from us, we can usually make that happen. If you want to test and give us some feedback, you know, this was the flume. Uh, it, you know, basically you had a uh, you had a breach, and sediment goes out and it goes downstream and laterally, and so um, it deposits on the side here. And so here's the flume and they have these transects with careful measurements. And here is the water surface profile computed, measured and computed with RAS at each of these transects downstream. And so the water surface profile during this event, um, we're, we're getting very well. And then here is the final bed elevation um, at each of these. And you can see that we, you know, you, it kind of scours in the main channel and deposits over here. and uh, you know, we're using these these combined non-Newtonian mobile bed dynamics to actually get um, a better result on these um, bed elevations. Okay, and then I just I just have to say that uh, you know this is you know I've presented today, but this work was done on you know, Alex Sanchez. You know, wrote a lot of this code, and you know Ian Floyd, he is the point guard of 
Yeah. Uh, he's the point guard of the Corps of Engineers post wildfire um, response. Uh, and there he is. Uh, we're trying to, this is a Brian, um, Brian and Kelly's uh, uh, project um, out in uh, Colorado. Um, we're trying to do something to estimate brain size um, there. Go ahead and open RAS. And what you'll see is that I've given you, I've given you two plans. You have a clear water plan and a Bingham plan. Um, the clear, it, so the Bingham plan basically is what we're gonna do. Um, I've already done what we're gonna do. So if you just wanna run both these plans and look at results, you can. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a second Bingham plan together. Um, and so this is the clear water result. And so it should look like this. And you know, the, the look and feel of RAS is gonna change. Um, RAS 7.0 is gonna be completely different. But this is kind of cool because it tells you all the files that are open, the project file, the plan files, the clear water, the geometry, and then the unsteady flow is the clear water. Okay, so now you wanna open the unsteady flow data. So these are the flow models. You've got steady flow, quasi unsteady flow, which is what we often use for sediment and unsteady flow. Now we don't do steady or quasi unsteady debris because it's it's fundamentally dynamic. And so it's gonna be unsteady. And so you choose the hydrograph QT, or you can go to, it's funny, I don't ever I don't ever use the menus, so I always have to look at where it is, but you can go to edit unsteady flow. And that will open your unsteady flow editor. Now, if you kind of want to see what's going on, you can also open mapper. Mapper is this kind of this, it looks like this map here. You go to GS Tools RAS Mapper. And that will open basically our GIS. What happened a few years ago is that the RAS team, you know, we were, we did use ArcGIS as a pre and post processor and ArcGIS is a great tool, but ArcGIS does like a thousand things and we needed to do seven. <laughs> and so um, Mark Jensen wrote uh, and Alex Kendi, they wrote basically a GIS just to do the things we need to do. It's a lot faster, it's a lot smoother, it's, it's seamless. And so um, here is the terrain that I made of this pipe and you can turn on the grid and see um, see the grid. And so I've also added upstream and downstream boundary conditions. And so because I've added these upstream and downstream boundary conditions, they show up by default here. You need an upstream boundary condition and a downstream boundary condition. Um, and uh, upstream, we're using a flow hydrograph. Um, we did a little trick here. Uh, these flows are very small. And so we put them in in cubic meters per second, but then we put in a multiplier 0 0.001 to scale them down um, because RAS won't actually remember that many sig figs. Um, but if you run this event, um, you can run the Clearwater event by going to this little running guy. This running guy, a running person, um, if you press compute, um, it will do the clear water simulation. And what you'll see here, some of you might not be um, used to this. We chose a time step of 0.1 seconds, but we actually have a tool that chooses, that lets you choose an adaptive time step. And what it does is it subdivides the time step based on the current condition. Um, I have a video on this if you're interested in this, um, but uh, that's what's going on here is we're subdividing the the uh, the time step based on the current condition. And so the time step goes all the way down to 0 0.006 seconds. And took about 32 seconds to run. All right, now we have a result. And so if I choose velocity, you'll see there's my water. It's all blue. And so what I can do is I can, you know, what if I look at here, what's the maximum velocity? The maximum velocities are in the 1.4 range. And so that's in the blue range. But if I want more, um, more differentiation, I can right click on velocity, layer properties. I can go to edit and I can make this maximum of two. Create a new ramp that only goes up to two. And now, you know, my velocities look a lot faster, right? But it'll give me something to compare the Newtonian velo the non-Newtonian velocities to. Okay, so that is my clear water flow. But that's not what we came here to do. We came here to do some non-Newtonian flow. So I'm gonna go back to open my flow model because I'm gonna copy it as 
here is, so I'm gonna push either this flow button or I'm gonna to go to edit, unsteady flow data. I'm gonna to go to file, save as, save unsteady flow data as, and I'm gonna call this um, debris workshop. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it Frank. Um, and so now I've got a new um, flow file. Now I can go to options, non-Newtonian parameters, and I, I'm using 6.2 here. Um, I think it all looks the same except for the lava, but just in case something looks a little bit different, um, that's what's going on. We have Newtonian assumptions here, um, and it, 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 it remembered some of the data, um, but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to choose the switch, change this to Bingham. The concentration goes here. These are all laboratory data from this experiment. And so this is uh, you know, 69.2. Um, I give you the data in the PowerPoint presentation. And then if you come down here, and then um, I'm not gonna bulk because they told me the flow that was coming into the flume of the mixture. And so if I bulk it, then I'm gonna double count the sediment. And so I don't wanna do that, I'm not gonna bulk. In general, you're probably going to bulk though. In general, you'll probably have a flow hydrograph and a sediment concentration, and you want RAS to put those together. But because this is a lab experiment, I'm not going to bulk. And then again, because this is a lab experiment, they measured the yield strength in pascals and the mixture or dynamic viscosity in pascal seconds. But you have a Coulomb um, for the uh, for the yield that that's the clastic or you could use the exponential. And if you use the exponential, what I put in there, these are actually, I think these are the parameters that back out to their computed. Um, but you can see that for the exponential, you've got these two powers. And if I press F1, it'll take me to the non-Newtonian user's manual where I can you know, find the information on those, uh, those parameters, user input and parameters, yield stress, um, and uh, here are the here are the um, the, the you know, default parameters that I that I could use. Um, we are not putting those directly in RAS anymore because it's just, it's too easy to get to them. Um, all right, but I'm going to go back to user yield and then user defined viscosity 1.92. Um, and so I literally just put in three numbers. I, I chose one drop down. I put in three numbers. Um, if you use the exponential, you'll have to put in five. That's all I did. And so, you know, we just talked for 80 minutes about what this does internally in RAS, but what you have to do is not much. And so I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to save. And then you'll notice that now my plan's blanked out. Why is my plan blanked out? Well, because I created a new unsteady file. And so there is no plan that points to these two files. So I'll go to file, save plan as, and I'll call this debris workshop. And we like naming things in RAS so much, we make you name it twice. Um, the short ID is actually a really clever idea because you don't always want to give your long title, you don't always want your long title to show up in your plot. So if you give it a short ID, then that it, it's a lot of times that's that just makes your plots a lot cleaner. Um, say okay, save, and then I'm going to run this again. Compute, and what you'll notice is that uh, it's it it is not quite as stable. It has to go through a number of different iterations for time step, um, and that's just because of what's going on between the cells, and uh, there's just a lot more going on. Um, but it it still runs pretty quickly and anytime I see instabilities what I'm looking for is this error what's the error and the errors are still pretty small um, just because you get these these messages where that it went to 20 iterations doesn't mean that your model's unstable it just means that hey we went to 20 iterations it didn't converge and uh, but the, that means we just didn't go to the 0 0.01 tolerance but we went to the 0 0.05 that that's generally good enough okay so now I'm going to go back to mapper and now I have a second result. So uh, the non-Newtonian option is in options. It's, so it's in your unsteady flow data. It's in options in the unsteady flow. 
go to non-Newtonian parameters. And that's where you'll get that menu that we just uh, th that we got that we put the things stuff in. And uh, I'm also gonna I'm gonna go in and change these layer properties too. And I'm gonna also give this a max velocity of two and remap that so we can kind of see how the velocities compare. And so now, you know, the max velocity for this is about 0.38, whereas the max velocity for um, for the water was like 1.5. And so now what I can do is I can try to be fancy and I can try to choose the same time, the same time step for the two of them. Uh, this is second five. And so I'll go here and make this second five. And then I will, I want to plot this higher. So I'll move this to the top. And so now you can see here is our, at second five of the simulation, here is our Newtonian result with our non-Newtonian result. Our non-Newtonian result's a lot, a lot um, slower. But if I right click here, I can plot the time series and I can plot the velocity. And so you can see the debris is, you know, reaches a pretty stable velocity of like 0.4, was, whereas the, the Newtonian pretty stable velocity over 1.5. But now let's turn those off and turn the depths on. What's gonna happen with the depths? Well, if I come here again and I right click and I plot the depths, well, now the debris depth is a lot higher because obviously that you know, that velocity has to go somewhere, right? Um, it's continuity. And so our debris depth is a lot higher. Our time of arrival for the water is sooner. But um, when the debris gets there, it's it's deeper. 